This episode of Indie Impact is brought to you by the Pixelation Patreon. If you would like to get early access or your name in the credits of videos just like this one, click the link in the description and pledge your support for a dollar or more. I truly appreciate the support. In my career writing game reviews, something has made itself abundantly clear. The indie market is very interesting. If you happen to be strapped for cash, no problem. You can find a good time on Steam, IndieDB, Game Jolt, or a variety of other sites for free 99. If you're willing and able to shell out a few bones, once again, you can count on Steam, but also the PSN, the Xbox Marketplace, and the Nintendo eShop are reliable options if you're more of a console gamer. Hello and welcome back to Indie Impact, where I'll be taking a casual glance at some indie titles that can be found on one or more of the aforementioned platforms, discussing their pros, their cons, and letting you know if they're impacts or setbacks. So, without further ado, here are today's selections. I adore video games, if it wasn't obvious by the whole video game review shtick. If you want to investigate a series of murders and date a high school girl, there's Persona. If you want to play football, I, I mean, you could just go outside and play, but if you're fat and lazy like myself, you can play Madden. Or, if you'd like to experience the ultimate fantasy of interacting awkwardly with another human after a night of awkward drunken sex, uh, you could play the first game on today's list, One Night Stand, developed by Ken Moku and published by Radalika Games. In One Night Stand, you play as an unnamed protagonist who wakes up with little to no memory of what happened the night before, the only clues being that he's naked and sleeping next to a woman whose name escapes him. If you choose to treat her with kindness and empathy like a decent human, you can walk away with a new friendship. But you can also choose to be an absolute cretin, which is also fun. I achieved each of the 12 possible endings, but on average each playthrough takes half an hour, so even if you choose not to be a completionist, this one won't take up much of your time. Let's look at the pros of One Night Stand. It has hand-drawn artwork and rotoscope animations that make you feel as if you're talking to an actual person, which could be exciting if you don't get outside all that often. It's a digestible experience with a story that takes less than an hour to complete, or three if you're a filthy, disgusting completionist. Let's look at the cons of One Night Stand. It has 12 disparate endings, and while I did unlock them all, some are super vague as to how they're unlocked, and even though the game is relatively short, once you've completed the game once or twice, it becomes a chore to endlessly replay it in search of the rest. In fact, not only are some of the endings vague as to their unlock wrecks, despite the fact that there are 12 distinct endings, there needed to be a bit more variation between each. It seems as if there are two major end results. You can either get kicked out for being an asshole, or you can leave on good terms, and many of the endings only slightly subvert those results. One Night Stand is developed by Kenmoku and published by Radalika Games, who provided me with a code for the Switch, and is available via Steam for $2.99, as well as PS4, Switch, and Xbox for $4.99. I am gonna say that One Night Stand is an impact. It's a bite-sized, stylistic experience that gives players a taste of the fantasy that is human interaction, while not objectifying or demeaning the characters, largely opting to present a hopeful future for both parties. I doubt I'm the only person who wonders if the games we played back in the 90s would still be fun today or if they've aged like milk. I think back to that era and a few titles come to mind. Blasto, Jersey Devil, Tomba, and it could just be nostalgia speaking, but I'd like to think that they'd still be fun. In the second game on today's docket, we'll be putting that theory to the test. If there was a modern game that emulated the raw aesthetic of the PS1, would it still be fun, or are we just nostalgia whores? 
back in 1995 does precisely that. It looks and feels as if it were developed using technology from the mid to late 90s, with character models and camera angles resembling the original Resident Evil or Silent Hill games. Back in 1995 puts you in the slow-moving shoes of Kent, whose solitary goal is to reach a certain tower, but it's easier said than done thanks to the monsters that roam the halls and rooftops. It gets crazier from here, but I'd like to avoid spoiling it for anyone watching. Let's look at the pros of back in 1995. It commits to the 90s aesthetic for better or worse. I adored and despised the attention to detail, as if it's been a while since you've played a game like this, you'll spend more time searching for clues on how to progress than you will actually progressing. It doesn't give you a handicap, which I'd say is either a pro or a con depending on what kind of gamer you are. It is more than it seems to be, employing a metafiction element that reframes the narrative in a really interesting way, which made me glad I stuck it out and played the game to completion. Let's look at the cons of back in 1995. It commits to the 90s aesthetic, for better or worse. I abhor the incessantly repetitive music and sound effects, the latter of which were grating on the ears. In an actual game from this era, it'd be expected to have repetitive and unrefined sound design because there was limited space on the discs or cartridges. But the truth is, this game was not designed or released in the 90s. I get commitment to the gimmick, but there's such a thing as taking it way too far, to the point that it becomes a detriment to an otherwise enjoyable experience. Back in 1995 is developed by Throw the Warped Code Out, and published on PC by Degika and on consoles by Radalika Games, who provided me with a code for the Switch. It is available via Steam, Switch, PS4, and Xbox for $9.99 across the board. I am gonna say that back in 1995 was a setback. I don't regret my time with it, and I am glad that I stuck it out and played until the very end, but I can't in all confidence recommend it to anyone at that price point. If you can catch it on sale for less than a fiver, then I'd say maybe consider picking it up, but otherwise, uh, let's just say I think there's a good reason games like this aren't made anymore. In the last few years, we've seen a rise in self-aware horror games. In Undertale, we were given a choice to kill, be killed, or rise above. In Doki Doki Literature Club, we were faced with a sentient AI with emophilia. But now, with the recently released Buddy Simulator 1984, we get to explore a world of metafiction while contending with an AI who has a habit of bending over backwards for our approval. Buddy Simulator 1984 accomplishes something that sets it apart from games like Undertale and Doki Doki. While it starts out as a traditional text adventure, it doesn't stay that way for long. In no time, the eponymous Buddy AI works overtime to evolve the game experience into a 2D mother slash earthbound inspired RPG, then into a 2.5D adventure, and then into a 3D format akin to the Elder Scrolls Arena. I prefer not to spoil the reasons for this transformation, but trust that it's a fantastic change of pace. Let's look at the pros of Buddy Simulator 1984. It's set in a multifaceted world and delivers some seriously creepy yet wholesome moments if you allow yourself to be fully immersed. It's on the shorter side, taking around five hours from start to finish, but it manages to provide a really interesting, memorable experience that makes the earlier comparisons warranted. Let's look at the cons of Buddy Simulator 1984. In the segments with the turn
turn-based RPG elements, the balancing is all over the place. I had battles that I could successfully win while blindfolded, but since there are no real stats to upgrade aside from your extremely limited equipment, there are enemies that'll wipe the floor with your 2.5D carcass. I know there are story explanations for this balancing issue, but it sometimes felt like certain battles were scripted losses, but they were just really difficult. Buddy Simulator 1984 is developed and published by Not A Sailor Studios, who gave me a code for the PC release. It is available exclusively for the PC for a normal price of $9.99. I am gonna say that Buddy Simulator 1984 is most definitely an impact. It's a beautiful love letter to the 80s and 90s eras of gaming that delivers a creepy and wholesome dichotomy that should not be missed under any circumstances. If you enjoy games that are capable of making you nervous while also making your heart ache, make an effort to pick up Buddy Simulator 1984 as soon as you can. Thank you for watching this episode of Indie Impact. If you'd like to see more stuff like this, please consider subscribing here on YouTube, or if you'd like to help support the channel, get early access, and get your name in the credits all at once, you can join my Patreon by clicking the link in the description. Until next time, this is Pixelation, reminding each and every single one of you to stay pixelated.